Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for being on this webinar for exploring Hinduism. This is, uh, again, Hindu University of America is a growing online university. We're built to help Hindus in America and around the world learn and connect with our authentic history and culture and traditions. Uh, my name is Ankur Patel. I'm the Director of Advancement of Hindu University of America. Again, thank you for being on. So it is my pleasure to get us started. And first of all, if you can, I'm sharing my screen, just gonna put that up there, present mode. And first of all, I'd like to introduce Dr. DK Hemahari and Dr. DK Hari. They are amazing people. I've gotten to know them recently. Uh, they had impressive lives and careers. And in the in uh, DK Hemahari in uh, technology and DK Hari in professional management, but they earned their doctorate degrees at Sri Sri University, and together they started the Bharatnyan Initiative, where They've traveled the world, learned so much, and spent decades researching, exploring, and making information about Hinduism more accessible to all of us. That's been their mission. Uh, they've written over 35 books, um, and we'll learn more about them through this webinar. We'll learn about the course that Hindu University of America is offering, and we're going to go through this webinar uh, in a series of questions presented by various people. So just some housekeeping. If uh, we have the two chat boxes, we have a chat box and a Q&A box. If you have a specific question, you can type that into the Q&A box. And for comments, conversations, you can put them in the chat box. And let me just get one started in the chat box. If you can, please share with us what city you are in right now. So if you can just type in one word in the chat box, which city are you in right now? And it is pretty impressive, right? Right away, we can see 22 people get into there. People, Detroit, San Diego, Mysore. I mean, it's just zoom, zoom, right? This is exciting to see people from around the world participating in this. So if you have questions, type them in the Q&A box, we'll get them, get to your questions after we get into some other questions by some panelists. So first of all, first person who will ask a question, it is my pleasure to introduce president of Hindu University of America, Goyan Vishwanathan, who will ask our esteemed panelists a first question to get us underway. Thank you, Goyanji. Okay, can you stop sharing your screen? <coughs> All right, everybody. Uh, good morning, and a very warm welcome to uh, Dr. Hari and Hima Hari Ji. Um, namaste. Now, uh, my my very first question to you is: uh, you know, I understand you have been on a uh, twenty-year journey exploring Hinduism, yeah, and it, and in some sense, you gave up uh, ex extremely successful professional careers. To set, to set on this journey, which has brought you to this point. If I may ask you, what got you inspired? What, why, did you, why did you start this journey? I mean, why didn't you just stick with your professional careers like everybody else does? And uh, what got you going? What, what was the reason? Okay, over to you. Okay, we, uh, as you said, both of us were professionally employed for two decades and we have been around the world seeing different aspects of different civilizations and uh, which is wonderful. So when you look at the Indian civilization, we wanted to study, understand the beauty of the civilization, the various facets and uh, the Hindu civilization as a whole, we saw it as a big jigsaw puzzle. There are too many pieces and we just couldn't know where to fit which piece into what. Even though we have been grounded in the uh, Hindu ethos, born in Hindu families, I've had a good traditional upbringing, both of us before our marriages, but still 
everything was a big jigsaw puzzle and we didn't know where not the of, corners were where the edges were which to fit where it's lot of conflicts too you know like uh, especially when you are exposed to modern sciences then you have questions on either side science tells you something and then you hear something else so you wonder where which is the real truth so okay. that's where we wanted to find out what these first of all we wanted to find what are these jigsaw puzzle pieces and sort of put them on a board and see if they all fit in if so how do they fit in and the funniest thing is you know this was emerging to be a jigsaw where they were we couldn't even get the edge pieces or the corner pieces you know it just seems boundless just infinite it's just going everywhere whichever direction you go Mm -hmm. and it's like brahma's head four heads yeah. all directions right. <laughs> and yeah. different levels as well yeah so, so it looks like hinduism we, itself itself absolutely. is kind of boundless right absolutely yeah. so that's when we started you know systematically compiling what we were learning mm -hmm. and uh, you know we approached scholars we would talk to scientists to get our ideas ratified and all of that we started putting it down and uh, that's when we realized that it was not possible to put it down in the form of a, you know a writing because each one would lead and there were so many cross references and each one was corroborating the other so we took a building block kind of an approach and we resorted to multimedia because you know 20 years ago multimedia had uh, you know sprung up and there was this possibility to link from one to the other and jump across so then we started putting them together like that and uh, we grew a, a you know a kind of huge repository and uh, till date uh, we have about uh, 108 over 108 uh, such subject capsules actually it is wrong to be classifying in that sense because it's such a integrated thought but given the way we understand today we had to kind of compartmentalize compartmentalize it somewhere so we started putting them as capsules we call them subject capsules you know pop them in and swallow water and there presto <laughs> you you know hinduism now <laughs> or, or just so, one that, one bit one little bit of hinduism right yes. that's right <laughs> actually i can show you some of those it will be quite interesting well, if uh, hema ji if you don't mind i i want to keep in the interest of keeping it going right i'm going to Uh, pass the baton to nimai nimai dikshit um so nimai is uh, uh, is a one is a young person he's less than 30 years old he's uh, he works for standard and poor up uh, in new york city area uh, and he's also the uh, youth coordinator for the hindu swayam sevak sangh in uh, north america and he's taken on coordinating the youth panel uh, or the panelists will be asking yeah. questions So with that little introduction uh, Nimai uh, take it away. Yeah, thank you Kalyanji. So um I'll just be uh, sort of uh naming the there are some Kishore uh, some sorry teenagers here who have uh uh some questions that that are that are prepared and they're going to be asking uh, Himaji and Hariji and uh that's kind of how the flow of the uh, panel will go. Um so uh, just to start it off um Shivaji Thirumala will be asking the first question so Shivaji if uh, you can unmute yourself and uh, ask your question So you were speaking to saying how you had a lot of questions in your journey so what were some of the examples of your questions that led you in this journey and in your journey what was your first major mi milestone like everybody you know especially in uh, a hindu uh, the first thing that pops up is are our gods real people because we celebrate their birthdays and we talk about the cities they were born and the lives they led and every uh, town in india or and uh, you know in case of rama even in sri lanka you find that oh this place claims to be the place where such and such an event happened so are these really real people where they real where they historical so that was our initial starting point and then we started uh, you know understanding more about uh, divinity such as rama and krishna for for example these are the two people if you really look at 
the lot of uh, the entire gamut of Hindu literature, there are only two works which are called itihasa. The word, very word itihasa itself means it thus happened. So somebody, the person who has written these works is telling us that it thus happened. It happened like this. So he's saying something real. He is, uh, the narrative is about a real set of events, some real personages and so on. So the next question then pops up. Okay, if so, then when did this happen? So there comes a different challenge because unlike a uh, lot of uh, things that we can read today and relate to in terms of uh, earlier AD, BC, and in present times, you say common era CE and BCE, which is before common era, the dates or the time in the Hindu literature is not mentioned in the form of Gregorian calendar dates. They are mentioned in terms of the Hindu calendar and more so in terms of the skies itself. They have even gone beyond calendars and talked about the events in terms of just the sky configurations. So how do you understand those kind of configurations? What do you make sense out of that? How do you then translate that into a date that we can relate to today? So that became the next challenge. So that led us to understanding how Hindus kept time. And you will be really amazed at uh, you know, the kind of time spans that uh, they were very comfortable dealing with. Uh, today, we only can deal with 12 hours. It can be day 12 hours or a night time of 12 hours in the clock because that's all it can accommodate. Whereas these people could deal with time spans that could span across earth uh, revolutions and you know, beyond earth, Jupiters and you know, so many other different combinations. It's amazing. So then the question comes up, how did they know all that? So then you come to the mother of all questions. <laughs> And if you say mother of all questions, I'm sure you have a lot of questions in your mind, Shivaji, and quite a few other youngsters and elders also here. Of all these questions, which is the mother of all questions or the most difficult question to answer? You need to ask how this universe came to be. That's the mother of all questions that you can ever think of in your mind. And that is a question that's been asked by the Hindu Rishi of yore, few thousand years back, probably six, seven millennia ago. And not only have they asked these questions, they've answered them also. And that is called, there's a subject called Shishti Vigyana. Okay. So that, that's a subject called Shishti because Shishti means Srijan, to be born. Vigyana is knowledge, Vigyana is science. So Shishti Vigyana is a science of creation. So we were able to compile a lot of information on that and bring it out as a book called Creation Shishti Vigyana. It was one of our early books and we also made a documentary film on it. It's a one hour film and about 20 short films. It's there on a YouTube channel, all of you can view it. So it's amazing, it just opened up. And what it did is, all of you are aware of uh, the famous Fermi Laboratories in the US or the CER and CERN Laboratories in Geneva, Switzerland. So again, these information was we were able to discuss with those scientists and what we came up with something quite interesting which again we have shared in the short films that we made which, which you can view we have interviewed some scientists and brought out different aspects you can see that how there's a parallel between the two the ancient traditional hindu concept of creation and the modern scientific postulates on creation they converge and intertwine quite well that's the beauty of it and in some places, uh, you know, you'll be amazed to see how the Hindu thought even goes beyond what beyond the questions that are being asked by science today. And not just ask the questions, they have even given answers to those questions. So it is only up to us now to be able to dig into those repositories, try to relate to them, to be able to break a lot more glass ceilings that are waiting to be broken. For example, what you call the Big Bang is in the Hindu thought, it is expressed as Brahmanda Visphotak. Visphotak meaning explosion, Brahmanda is universal. 
and what you call as the cosmic egg in modern science is what they call it as hernia garba garba is womb womb of the universe and hernia is golden hued so it's, it's because of it all the energy in it is golden hued like that we can discuss more more as we go along it's all there for uh, public viewing in our youtube channel and in our book you can and see. we'll be covering this in the course as we go as, as well. one full session of the course deals only with this subject thank you for your question shivaji uh thank you hemaji harji the next question will be uh, from atharva kandar yeah namaste so my question is can you share a little bit about the many books that you have written together what we did is we wrote a series called the autobiography of india because it it's about all of us writing about the hindu civilization ourselves that's what you written about this offering of a range of books like this that you written as you can see from understanding uh, i mean uh, the historicity of rama to krishna to creation to <laughs> understanding shiva historical krishna is three volumes that you can see in the bottom there all those things the breaking the myths about the hindu civilization so each aspect yeah, you have taken I'll about show it on the web That's so we can show it on the web so that you can uh, understand that much better so look, look at this so we call them the autobiography of india series and uh, where we talk about uh, how india was a brand for the world and that was because of things that were made here the concepts that took root here things that are unique to india and are available only in india people have to come here to see it very hindu style of living and the hindu thoughts that came out of it like the sari the bindi which are there on the cover itself then the leads from india so how has hindu thought shaped the world the different civilizations of the world how have they been influenced and what do they uh, you know acknowledge and therefore what is the future that this hindu civilization can offer to the world in modern times so just look at the first four books it's about what all the hindu thought hindu civilization offered to the world over the last 3 4 millennia that's all in the past what is it that the hindu mind can offer to the world in the current future next few generations that's what is called the, the future so we get dwelt into the ethos of hindu thought to bring that out then where then are the series called breaking the myths so here we break myths about identity the hindu identity about society where we cover about uh, women caste system education and uh, religion and then we talk about prosperity because there are a lot of myths you know just because you see a lot of hindu sadhus and swamis it means that hindus are basically poor they did not have any prosperity the hindu civilization is basically a poor civilization so then we break those myths about the uh, prosperity and say and how it is a very prosperous civilization the whole thought is a prosperity thought so and, uh, uh, hari, also, hari ji let me interrupt yes. you are you showing a website or are you showing a powerpoint right now uh, this is our website okay we're not seeing it okay you got to sh stop sharing i, I share i know oh, you stop right. please stop sharing and share again and start it again yeah start your sharing again Okay. Yeah, we can see the website now. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Also, thank you. Uh, we are getting a request from some people to for the panelists to come closer to the microphone. D K Hari Ji and fine. Yeah, because their voice is very low. So, uh, like I said, these were the uh, brand uh, uh, Bharat series, and then these are the myth breaker series, breaking the myths about identity, society, prosperity, and ability. then connect over millennia so how was this hindu civilization connected with various other ancient civilizations of the world and uh, there is this book 2012 the real story uh, which was written uh, in 2012 itself and uh, this is actually about the connect between the hindu civilization and the ancient american civilization so uh, it will be, be very interesting to note here the hindu civilization from india had a continuous and regular connect with the civilization of the central america 
from the west coast of america that is from the east coast of india sailing through to the indonesia islands which were then called as suvarna bhumi and they went to philippines and then go, going on to the polynesia micronesia islands and then reaching uh, the west coast of mexico that is what we brought out in this book because this had this has actually earlier written by an united states of america ambassador by name miles point dexter in the year 1931 when he was the ambassador to mexico so he researched and wrote this book called arya inca so like that there's a big connect across the continents we have brought that out okay then and then we have written about the internal uh, uh, states of india and uh, about mm -hmm. new india then the understanding series you know which is what we talk about how do we understand the hindu concepts of creation shiva uh, one of our recent books now recently uh, on the net is swami ayappa so like that and uh, there are many more in the pipeline and uh, then we have these historical series about rama and krishna and uh, can we scroll down yes yeah so rama and uh, historical krishna then about utsav uh our diwali book is uh, will be out soon on the web initially and see, uh, see we have a list of compilation for each festival that the hindu celebrate starting with sankranti to the hindu new year calendar then to uh, our navratri uh, navratri and dipavali and all these festivals so we cover the 12 months of festivals that the hindus have because hindus have a ability to celebrate for every reason and every season that's what we have brought out in this utsav series i hope uh, and besides this actually i want to show you uh, i think you all will be very much interested in seeing that there are a lot of mini books we have written which are there on our website for uh, reading as it is free read there are about close to about 50 plus mini books that we have on these subjects that you can all read and uh, short books all about 30 40 50 pages different different aspects so that's that uh great uh, uh so the next question is all about the festivals the sorry sorry continue there is something very interesting on kumbh how to understand kumbh because very often uh, you know uh, people tell the hindus hey look at this you know you just uh, have a huge bathing festival and uh, you've made it into such a massive affair uh, and uh, many of us don't know how to explain this so we have something on kumbh and it's a beautiful story that spans from the earth the rivers all the way up to the skies and it's it's a real beautiful story and which we hope to be telling you uh, you know when in the one course one of our course sessions okay thank you atarva for asking this nice question thank you all right so the next the next question will come from uh, aniket aniket yeah um so i have a question for you guys um what brought you into the path of um, dating krishna and rama um is it historical are they historical as uh, my wife said some time back both rama and krishna looked at us itihasa that's how the text explain very clearly itihasa meaning it thus happened unfortunately what happened was uh, a couple of centuries back all the hindu texts were uh, dubbed as mythology and the word mythology comes from the greek word myth which in turn comes from the word mythos which is similar to the hindu sanskrit word mithya meaning not true so even though we call the hindus call it itihasa the others called started calling it mythology so there was a two different perspectives here while one school was calling it mythology that only for last 200 years the hindus per se for the last couple of millennia and more have been calling it itihasa so where does the fact lie is it mythology or is it because if, if it is itihasa it means it's history so that's why we we did research and get the exact dates of krishna and rama from a from a 
multidisciplinary perspective. That's what we did. And we have a capsule that we can just show you uh, for a minute. Can you share the screen? Can you see the screen? Any yeah. kid? Yes. Hmm? Okay. Now, if you go into it, now we go to we go to historical Rama now, and uh, you can see that. So this is a detailed presentation which we'll be taking in the session on historical Rama because uh, so did Rama really exist? Because divinity is a matter of faith, historicity is a matter of existence. So if he existed, what proofs do we have? So we have looked at it from a next next. So we looked at it from a four perspective. Uh, like a quadrangle, we looked at four perspectives. One is from the literature, other is from geography, and the third is a new subject called archaeoastronomy, and the fourth is the traditional archaeology. In archaeoastronomy, what we have done is in archaeology, you dig into the ground. You use a shovel or a pickaxe to dig into the soil. Whereas in archaeoastronomy, you dig into the sky. And what are the tools you use for digging into the sky? You use software, calendar. So we use something called the planetarium software to dig into the sky and get that. Similarly, if you look at archaeology, you've got two fields in archaeology. One is the traditional archaeology that you do on the ground. Other is the marine archaeology that you do in the sea. So, the, uh, so there are two aspects to it. So there are two aspects, traditional archaeology and say marine archaeology. We have done both to get to the, the actual facts. Okay. And we have done similarly for both historical Rama and historical Krishna. So we have two books separately for each. So dealing with each one of them and we'll be covering them in our sessions. Because not only are they gods, but divinity who have come down uh, in avatar. So what is the concept of avatar? How do you understand that? And they actually help us date this civilization. So tell us how far way back does it go? And what was therefore the Hindu way of life? So, uh, you know, these two divinities are very important with respect to our timelines. There's actually two important key pegs in pegging the timeline of the Hindu civilization. And we have a separate presentation on that, which will be part of our, uh, one of our sessions where we look at the expanse of the Hindu timeline going back many millennia, probably about six, seven millennia and more. Okay? Okay. Thank you for your question. So the next question is from uh, Sumana Turimala. Um, so going off of that last question, uh, what about the dates for Shiva, Ganesha and other deities? Wonderful. Wonderful, nice. <laughs> Glad you asked that. Um, see, actually, you know, if you go back, uh, I, I said there are only two works which are uh, categorically stated as Itihasa, that is the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. And they are about two avatars of Vishnu, Rama and Krishna, as you know. And of course, all the people who lived around them. If you go to Shiva, then, then you talk about Vishnu then. We say they are avatars of Vishnu. So then who is Vishnu? And what about Shiva? So uh, is Shiva for real? Is Ganesha for real? Because we, just like Rama had a wife and children, uh, Shiva also has a wife and he has got two sons and uh, so on. So how do you understand these people? Can you date them? And I'm, I can understand your dilemma. Now, if you really go, this is where, you know, a good understanding of creation really comes into help. So if you start tracing from creation, the idea of creation from the Vedic thought, that is where it's described. And from the Vedic thought, it has been later on taken into the Purana. Then you get to see how the divinities have developed. Who are Devas? And then who are the Trinity? And why were they uh, described in such forms? Then you understand this, that uh, you know, divinities such as Shiva, Ganesha, Kartikeya, uh, Brahma, Vishnu, they are tattva, meaning they are the essence, they are the principles that drive this entire, uh, that describe how this creation is functioning and how the, how the civilization, Hindu thought, had extracted out various aspects of uh, creation and sustenance and 
you know, given a beautiful, created a beautiful pantheon of divinities called the Tattva. And therefore, what role do they have in our day-to-day -day life? How do we relate to them? How do we connect to them? And uh, so this is what, uh, you know, divinities like Shiva, Vishnu, Brahma, and all of them signify. And not just them, the, the way they have been portrayed and the relationships that they have been, that have been ascribed to them, they also convey a lot of uh, aspects about the workings of the world. So you can't date uh, Shiva Ganesha, to put it simply. <laughs> so their concepts, what you call as Tattva, and she used a very nice word. She used the word Hindu pantheon of divinities. The word pantheon comes from the word pan, whole span, and Theo. Theon comes from the word Theo, which again comes from the Hindu word Div, meaning divine. The root for the word divine is from the word Div. Div means to shine, to glow. That's why you have the word Deva. They're glowing, they're shining. Right? So, so, so the, divine it, also comes from the same root and so does Theo. Theo. So that's why you in, the, in Rome you have this beautiful, uh, a very ancient building called the Pantheon. Okay, so that's why that's why you say pantheon divinity because there are a whole array of them, and each of them represent one aspect of nature or multiple aspects of nature that we will deal with uh, in the session when we deal on uh, Shiva, which is part of one of the sessions. How the concept of Rudra, the concept of Shiva, for example, all that we will deal with. If you look at the word Shiva itself, which we have said in our yeah, understanding I Shiva, that's a very very valid point. And in our film, short film, we have made about 20 short films on understanding Shiva. It's in our YouTube channel, Bharatya. You can view it after this program. In one of the short films, we explain the word Shiva itself, what it means. The word Shiva. Okay, what, what is the picture that you have of Shiva? What, what kind of a god is he? He is a, you would say, everybody immediately would say, oh, he's a god of destruction, right? So he's somebody to be feared. But if you really look at the meaning of his name, Shiva, it actually means auspiciousness. Mangalam. Mangalam. Mangal. Shiva means Mangalam. Auspicious. So Mang why is he called auspicious? The name itself means auspicious. Shiva itself means auspicious. So to understand that, then you have to get into understanding the Tattva of Shiva. So that, that is a very, very beautiful thing. And it will really dispel all the kind of misconceptions that we have that Shiva is a destructive god. And uh, the symbol lingam has got, uh, uh, you know, uh, various connotations and so on. So we will really get to understand uh, all that be beauty behind the Shiva Tattva. See, for example, I'll, I'll, see, Shiva resides in all of us, in you, in me, in every one of us. If Shiva leaves our body, what happens? What do you call such a body? Shava. Shava. Shava means what? No dead life. Body. Dead body. That's why in asana, you've got shavasana for non-movement, stillness. So when you have Shiva, you have life. When life goes out, it becomes Shava. So the opposite of Shiva is Shava. So you understand that? It's beautiful. We'll discuss more of this. The idea of Shiva and Shava and Shiva means life. So only when there's life, it's auspicious. If life goes out, it becomes inauspicious. Okay. Thank you, Sumana, for that very nice question. So um, now we'll take a little break in the questions and uh, Ankur uh, Patel will go over a uh, little more of the logistics around the course itself. All right, thank you, Nimayaji. Uh, Hemaji, Hariji, thank you so much. Right, that was only half an hour. And look at the breadth that we covered. There's so much uh, within Hinduism. And I saw some questions asking specifics about, you know, this or that within the context of Hinduism, we're not going to be able to get into all of the specific questions uh, that we all have. There's over 300 of us, the, the chat is Zoom. And so just in terms of the logistical parts that people are asking, where we will get into more depth, and as Hemaji and Hariji kind of alluded to, they've been doing this research for decades. They've compiled so much information to answer all these range of questions. And we've created this course, Exploring Hinduism, The Overview. And it's going to be... Um, starting July 8th, ending August 15th, three times a week, one hour each session. So over the course of the summer, 
we're going to have about 16 sessions. You know, there's a holiday here, there, there might be some flexibility in the exact uh, number of courses, uh, but we're going to be having three courses a week where in each of these courses, they're going to dig into some of the questions that they that were alluded to. And they even said, we'll cover what one, one whole session on this topic or that topic. So it's going to be starting in July 8th, going till August 15th. It's a 1.5 credit hour course, uh, right? Exploring Hinduism for teens and parents is an entire program of courses that we are developing. This is our inaugural course. Glad to have you considering this. Uh, it's a part of our continuing education program. There are no prerequisites. So anybody who has questions, you are welcome to join and we encourage it, right? This is really a, a, a first step, right? Get your feet warm, uh, in the water, understand what's off, being offered and participate with Hindu University of America. Obviously, uh, Dr. DK Hemahari and Dr. DK Hariji will be the faculty. Um, so the course is going to be 100% online, right? So everyone who enrolls will get an hua.edu email address to access our online learning management system where you log in, assignments will be there, readings will be there. Um, again, this is a fully integrated course that we're offering. The cost, everyone's always curious about that, for one person will be $200 for one student. But we're encouraging parents and students, families to enroll together. So we're offering this uh, kind of prorated discount, $300 for one parent and one team, two teams, two parents, $400 for three people, any combination, and $500 for your entire family. And each of you will get an HUA login, which means you will have your own assignments, your own reading, and we'll be able to keep track of your progress through the course. Um, so th those are some of the logistics. Uh, the overview in terms of our learning objectives, and we kind of got into that with this first half hour of discussion, right? There's so much to Hinduism. What are we going to accomplish in this course? Let me just go through this real quick with you. Uh, obviously, to develop a deeper understanding of the history, culture, and traditions of Hinduism. That's a general objective of Hindu University of America, which we've focused in on in this course. Discovering the various ways in which Hindus conceptualize and relate to the divine Again, we touched on some of that, but obviously in half an hour, we're just scratching the surface. Examining, uh, examine the wisdom of ancient Hindu traditions in the light of contemporary life. I saw somebody type that question into the Q&A box. Why are we even bothering with this if it's not relevant to modern life? Well, most of us, uh, well, some of us recognize that it is, and through this course, we'll examine how this ancient wisdom does uh, translate and have an impact on contemporary life, on what we do today. We're gonna to revisit and clarify certain pervasive myths that are prevalent, prevalent regarding Hinduism. We know that you know, Europe systematically tried to undermine our history and replace it, right? They learned Sanskrit to teach us about our traditions. Well, we're taking that back. We have a whole MA program on Sanskrit so that we can get into the actual text. And that's a whole separate quote. Uh, aspect, sorry for the tangent, we're going to recognize the place of Hinduism in the world and its contribution to humanity. And this is crucial for all of us, especially our youth here in America, to recognize the power of Hinduism. And it does have something to contribute to humanity. And it's up to us to recognize it, grow it, and bring it to the forefront. We're going to discover new conversational spaces within the family, unexplored so far. This webinar right here is part of that opportunity to connect with Hindus from around the world see and create spaces where we can have this conversation. And finally, we're going to learn to describe and talk about Hindu ideas and our thought with others, which is so important. And as an American born Hindu, uh, this is the kind of course I wish I had growing up. So we're going to open it up to everyone for questions. Nimaya is going to uh, kind of moderate and handle that. Again, use the Q&A box at the, the bottom as opposed to the chat to ask your questions. There's already 26 questions. We're gonna try and filter through this. Uh, and thank you for participating. I hope that answered some of your logistical questions. Please ask specific individual questions. You can ask those directly. Let's uh, try and have general questions that you think would benefit the entire group uh, now. So Namaya, let me hand it back over to you and uh, we'll facilitate the open question and answer session. I will stop sharing. 
Uh, yeah, so uh, before we get into uh, the uh, open Q&A, there's, there's a couple more questions here uh, prepared by the teams to give a little more um, color on the course itself. Uh, and uh, so we'll just go through a few of those and then we'll get into the, uh, uh, into the general Q&A. So I think Reva Palera, um, if you're there, uh, uh, asking a specific question about the, about the course. Um, so, have you guys pursued any research on Hindu contributions to the world and the sciences? Nice question. And we have, uh, yes, uh, Reva, we have, and uh, uh, it's uh, we have brought out a book, not one, multiple books on that, and uh, one of them uh, it's called uh, Roots, in Roots in India, where we and. Uh, leads from India, two books we brought out, uh, the various Hindu sciences that have been taken to the world, a whole list of them, at least about 14, 40, you listen each book, so 40 plus 40, 80 of them, it's there for online, and we have also brought out all these things in the form of short films, called Amazing India series, it's there in a Bharat Gyan YouTube channel to watch, uh, we have certainly brought it out, and uh, you can certainly watch it. Actually, okay. you know, uh, if you look at it, two of the most important uh, contributions to the field of maths are from the Hindu thought itself. Like if you take zero and infinity. So Shunya and Ananta. So these two are grounded in Hindu thought. So what did they mean in Hindu thought? What did Shunya stand for? What did infinity, Ananta mean? And how did these two ideas travel to the West and get absorbed into the system world of thought. mathematics world and world thought? thought. Uh, that is something that uh, makes for a very good story. See, actually, if you see the word Shunya, which is a very Hindu word, Sanskrit word, from that the word travels to Persia, Arabia, Turkey, Greece, France, Germany, and then comes to England as zero. Okay, Shunya, when it goes to Arabia, it becomes Sifr. From there, when it goes, it becomes Zevro. From there, it becomes uh, Cipher. From there, it becomes Zero. So it's traveled across the lands, across centuries, across continents to come. Similarly, if you look at the word infinity, the word infinity, if the, uh, John Wallace gave it in the 1500s in England, the word infinity itself has its roots in the Hindu word Ananta. The word Ananta itself, Ananta Sayana, Ananta Sesha, Ananta is a very common Hindu word. So Ananta itself means infinite, infinity. So it is a Hindu word Ananta that again travels across the lands and also by, by ship over the oceans along with the goods that were taken from here. And the word, and when John Wallace wants to give a name for infinity, he calls it infinity because from taking the cue from the Hindu word Ananta. So the whole spectrum of from Hindu mathematics a whole host of science has developed. And which is why when Einstein says, he makes a very famous comment in the early 1900s. He says, without the Hindu, without the zero and Hindu numerals, no science would have been possible in Renaissance Europe. So it was the Hindu numerals, Hindu zero, Hindu infinity that gave Renaissance period of Europe, all the sciences to kickstart. That's why we choose what we say in the book uh, Leads from India, uh, where the, the Upanishad that was Upanishad was written went to uh, was translated as Upanishad in, in Persian and Arabian, and then went from there to uh, across Greece into Germany, and that was read and that formed a lot of scientific basis. We explain each book name in Germany in a, in eighteen hundreds. It's there. The list is there in our articles. In, our, in the Bharat Gyan blog, as well as in our short films and in our books. Okay. Actually, uh, you are Reva Bale Rao. Is that your name? Yeah. Okay. There was a gentleman, my name is Bale Rao, who gave us a book on Hindu sciences about 20 years back. From Pune. From Pune. I don't know whether you're late. No He's no more. He passed away 10 years back. So he gave us a book about how the river Ganga was a man-made river. He had researched it for 40 years of his life as an irrigation engineer in, in Maharashtra government. He was from Pune. 
and uh, so nice of him that at the end of his life he wanted to pass it on to somebody who will take up that research further and he identified us and, and gave it to us so yes. we have fond respect for the name bale rao <laughs> thank you and and incidentally reva is my childhood friend <laughs> she is in the us now <laughs> You bring back a lot of connects. Thank you, Neva. It's a coincidence. Um, next question is from Ayushi Gupta. So, will you be touching upon the controversial Hindu caste system in the course? Yes. How can somebody not talk about Hinduism? I mean, talk about caste system and talk about Hinduism. That has been, uh, you know, one of the foundations uh, of the uh, Hindu society. and uh, very sadly actually i'll i'll show you something no, very before, beautiful before, just show that before i'll tell you one thing ashi see uh, the word caste itself is not indian first of all it was imposed on the hindu thought only in the 18 1860s 1870s it's a portuguese word casta which means race r a c race of people what we had a uh, just so a caste system as it is stratified now has been imposed on hinduism by people who came to rule hindus whereas what we had the hindu thought had a very different system it was called the jati varna system so dual system of jati varna jati means jananam to be born so you are born in a particular family which has got certain skills and it's like a trade guild like the smiths blacksmith iron smith like that so the trade guilds each one of them had their own familial vocation so that was the jati you were born in okay and you lived as per your but similarly if you look at the word varna v r n a varna varna is not just color actually varna means to choose because you choose a color also you use the word varna for color it means to choose okay so what happens is you can choose which of the four uh straight as you want to be in which of the four professions professions you can be say for example i'll tell you what when i was a student i was a brahmana then when i went to do business i became a vaishya then when i went to work for somebody else for a job whatever they said i had to do then i became a shudra then i now come back both of us now come back into the field of knowledge so we have now, now again we have become a brahmana so you can migrate from one varna to another any number of times in your life so based on what your your attitude and an aptitude and your work you can migrate but you're born in a jananam jati you're born in a jati so live in the jati norms so that was a, it's a very flexible system you live as per your family traditions but you choose the vocation of your choice based on the time of your life and see that that's why they gave the name varna the varna means color and what is color it is something that you choose color indicates choice right and that is why you know in uh, india i mean in uh, most of the indian languages uh, a bridegroom you talk about a bridegroom or choosing a bridegroom as var var dunna so var you meaning choose var. to choose so swayam var self choice swayambar you must heard of the word swayambar in many hindu stories so varna means that which you choose the profession that you choose so you can choose to profess any of these four uh, occupations but you are born in a particular uh, ecosystem so that gives you a safety net it gives you a family bond but then you can go and do whatever occupation you want at whichever time of your life so that was flexible so actually it's a very beautiful system and what it really meant for the hindu society it had it was designed so with some meaning and what kind of a uh, benefit did it give to the society uh, we can look at it uh, she'll show you a short she just show you one short uh, uh, clip we have on the uh, jati varna system and caste you can go back from there just a second go back see one more so this is about the 
uh, uh, unfortunate accusation on the Hindu society. We take this accusation, explain it well, what it means. Because one of the uh, uh, you know accusations which are uh, that float around about the caste system is that because Brahmin are associated with the mouth of Vishnu, Kshatriya with the shoulders, Vaishya from the thighs, and Shudra from the feet. That is why the Shudra are meant to be trampled upon and so on. So that that's, uh, you know, they come very low in the order. So these are the kind of uh, myths that float around. That were unfortunately created, but so when you see the caste system was created by the British on India in the 1871 census, okay, going on to that. And we speak, we already spoke about the two words, Varna and Jati. Then and look at this idea. So it is not vertical, but horizontal. See, Vishnu can be shown to stand vertically or he can be shown to be supine horizontally. So where all the four are equal and each have a role to play. And instantly if you see Lakshmi, who is the at the feet of Vishnu, so she has all the wealth. The wealth is all with Lakshmi. So she is at the feet of Vishnu. So symbolically shows it's the Shudra who had all the wealth of the land. And there are records. Actually, there are records when the British that. took over India, the records show how all the wealth was with the masses and bulk of the population actually were the Shudra. So the people, they were the producers of the land. So they They're were the, the growers. growers. So that is where the wealth lay and naturally they were the maximum in number. So we have some very beautiful way of looking at this, a modern view of looking at such an organization of society. Uh, in our uh, book, uh, Breaking the Breaking Myths, the myths. Uh, About Society. About Society. We will deal with that uh, in one of the sessions that we, are, that we are doing with you. Okay? It will be a full one hour session. Thank you, Aishi. But it is very important to understand uh, about the caste system uh, because this is also tied a lot with uh, the... Uh, Hindu view of Dharma and what role each one had to play in society. So uh, that, that aspect, uh, they both go very closely together. All right. So the, the next question will come from Roshan. Um, so uh, will this course be covering the uh, colonization of India and the freedom struggle? Yes, we yes we certainly yes Roshan will be having one session on that. One of our sixteen is basically on that to bring out how the narrative of Hindu idea changed. When and how? When and how? Because what you today call Hinduism is actually made of Shadmadam, six religions, all having very similar but niche areas of appreciation of the divine, of propitiating the divine, and they are all. It was only during the colonial rule that they're all brought together as one religion, Hinduism. And we'll be bringing out all these aspects. Okay? Yes, okay. okay. We'll certainly be doing it. All right. And uh, yeah, I yes, go ahead, Nimai. Thank you. And I think the last couple of questions, we can kind of wrap them wrap into them. one, and then you can take it uh, uh, wherever you want to take it. So, uh, Tanush. Would you be able to ask your question? And then Tanisha, you can follow right up after him. Yeah, sure. Uh, what does it mean to be a Hindu today in our contemporary world here in America? Okay. Uh, see, fundamentally, when you uh, get to understand the Hindu thought uh, and what we do, uh, you will find that it is very closely connected with nature. It is to do with aligning oneself with nature, to be in sync with nature, and uh, this is very important uh, to make sure that you are leading a very sustainable life. That is point one. Point number two is how is it relevant today? And especially if you say, oh, we are from America, so how is it relevant to us here? The answer would be, if you really look at the last 200 years, uh, you know, the world has seen a gamut of change in economic models, political models, organization of nations, and so on and so forth. And many of them, many of these economic theories have actually failed. Uh, you, you, you can see how uh, many of these uh, structures uh, have come and gone 
like uh, colonialism and capitalism, socialism, communism, socialism, communism, so on and so forth. So, in whereas the, the Hindu thought and gives you a very clearly new paradigm shift. It's called humanism. That's a new way of looking. So that's a, it's a very new way of looking at things. So there's a Hindu economics, there's Hindu sciences, Hindu way of thought, and each one of this is a new narrative, at least for the people, the Hindus in the West. So once we give that perspective to all the Hindus, what comes out very clearly is that we can start looking at life from a newer perspective. And we can start making a difference in society itself. We can try to get... Now, when there is a need for new models in the world, we can come and put forth the Hindu model. And especially if you're in America, then all the better uh, for you to start pushing these kind of ideas, start being heard so that people, the world gets to hear the Hindu perspective of how to manage resources, how to live happily, organically, in a prosperous manner, in sync with nature and sustainably. Actually, if you look at our fifth book, Future, Future from India, that book deals with all this. There's going to be a paradigm shift happening and we are at the cusp of it and there's a Hindu thought that's going to be, that's going to take up the views. And we're, we're going to see that. And uh, we bring that out in that particular book and we'll be dealing with it in, in one of our sessions as we go along. Okay? Thank you, Tanush. And then, um, Tanisha, yeah. Kind of following Tanisha's question, um, overall, what are you hoping that teens and parents will accomplish or take away from this course? And uh, Hemaji Hariji, if you don't mind, as part of the answer, if you can talk a little bit about what, uh, maybe go into a little bit of details of the specific subjects that you'll be covering as well. Yeah, would you want to show the screen? You can show the screen and then we'll cover it. Yeah, I'll just share my screen in a minute. Uh, yeah, so fundamentally during this course, uh, I know it's going to be a 16 week, uh, 16, 16 session, session. Uh, packed course, uh, but this is just going to be an introduction where we will look at the various perspective, I mean, aspects of the civilization, right from identity, where did the Hindu civilization start? The geography, the timeline, the industry, what kind of industries did they practice? Trade has been a major facet of the uh, uh, Hindu civilization. And uh, how did they trade? Mainly from navigation. So we have various divinities for navigation. Like Varuna and all that. And actually the very word navigation, which is an English word today, comes from the Hindu word of Nav, Navgat. Even the word Nova, Nova's Ark, is from the Hindu word Nav. So then we move on to the, the society, like organization of society, then uh, calendar, the Hindu calendar, timekeeping, time -keeping. the festivals, the Utsavs. Yeah, actually, if you look at the word Utsav, the very word Utsav means uplifting. Because every festival is an uplifting experience for us. Utsah, that's the word you use. Utsuk. Utsavam. Uts means Uttishta, get up. So something that will lift you. Lift you up. Ut, lift your why, spirits. That's why when you have the morning, when you say the sloka, no, for Vakiteshwara, Uttishta, Uttishta, Govinda, Uttishta, Garudadvaja, Uttishta, Kamala, Kanta. So the Uttishta, get up. Uttishta, Utsav. Uplift you. So what all uh, was taught? What was the knowledge base of the Hindus? How did they impart this knowledge? to the uh, generations to keep this knowledge base sustained. So the system of education, then the language, Sanskrit itself. So fundamentally the ethos, the underlying ethos of a Hindu, what, it, what does it really mean? And you will see that uh, you know, it is in stark contrast with the way we lead uh, or we think we should lead our lives today. So that's very, very interesting. Uh, so that's about the, so fundamentally what we will do in this introductory course is look at each of these aspects and get to know about 
the Hindu way of living uh, in uh, uh, you know a perspective of that, so that we can then go into details of each of them, and then look at them in more detail. For example, then when we go into the festivals, we will understand why we celebrate certain festivals in the sense of what is the significance and how is it related, closely mapped with nature? What are the different ca categories of festivals itself? You know, see, sometimes we celebrate birthdays. Sometimes we are celebrating the lights. Sometimes we are celebrating a month uh, or a year, beginning of the year. So there are various kinds of festivals and they are, you can really slot them very distinctly. Some are days of observances, some are breath and some are for ancestors. So how do you look at these different festivals? How can you relate to them better? Uh, and what do they mean in present day? So these are kind of things that, so, so each of them, we will then take it in more detail. So that is about, uh, uh, you know, what we, and the idea is that once you have this, uh, and the reason we kept it open for teens and parents, because like uh, Ankur said, you know, there is really no prerequisite. Uh, you can be a Hindu, you need not be a Hindu as well. Uh, so the idea is that you can later on think, see, it doesn't stop here. The fundamental ethos of the Hindu civilization has been to seek and to discuss, to debate. So whatever you hear here uh, in this uh, forum, then it's for you to go back home and be able to discuss with your parents, with other uh, people who your are family, of similar. Your uncle, aunt, grandfather, grandmother. So you can, it's, it's not just for book reading or just to know for yourself, but it's, a, it's an opportunity to have spent quality family time with your family and discuss these things across your dining table, in your living room, in your lawn. So it's a much more holistic understanding of Hindu thought as a family. So this gives occasion. you an opportunity to be a seeker as well and come to your own understanding, your own conclusions, your own answers, and uh, which you can then further discuss with others. Kind of in a way, put you also on a path like we took. Thank you. Thank you, Tanisha. Um, and uh, Kalyanji, I'd like to hand it back to you. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, very good. So we are uh, just at the top of the hour. Okay, and uh, I wanted to make some remarks. I know the, the chat window has been very busy. You know, there's just a, a tremendous amount of traffic going on in the chat window. Now, a couple of things. See, first of all, uh, our Dr. D.K. Hari and Dr. Hema Hari, they have spent 20 years of their life exploring a number of topics, number of themes that they felt they needed to explore first and foremost for their own understanding. Am I correct? Yes, that's right. That's right. Now, they, uh, you know, and in order to uh, sort of share their knowledge, their learning and their understanding, they have written a number of books. Now, you know, in, in, we are bringing uh, their knowledge, you know, packaged into uh, a series of courses. So the very first course is what we are talking about today. And for those of you on the panel who want to know everything about Hinduism in this one hour, I am so sorry you're going to be disappointed. Because there is really so much to learn about Hinduism. There is really, I mean, you cannot wish away the enormity, the, the oceanic, almost cosmic nature of Hinduism. You know, um, and uh, ultimately, Hinduism is accessible only to those who want to learn, right? Now, uh, and, and uh, I, I noticed some people complaining that, uh, you know, we, we're selling you something, you know, selling a book or a course, etc. in the chat window. You know, please don't buy anything, okay? <laughs> My response to you is, if you want to learn something, the courses of Hindu University of America are available to you and very accessible to you. And, uh, uh, you know, if, uh, uh, if you're not interested in learning, obviously there are other things to do in life. Uh, and, you know, we're not uh, going to persuade you to learn against your uh, desires. 
Now, having said that, it is our intention that, uh, you know, as many of you, uh, both the teenagers as well as parents of teenagers, do take some time to engage with these questions. You know, and summer is a, is a wonderful opportunity. Everybody's home, uh, you know, and this particularly at this time, the coronavirus still uh, very dangerous out there. It's a good time to engage in these questions, take these questions a little more seriously, uh, learn from them. You don't have to accept everything that they're saying, challenge them, ask them lots of questions, and they will take you through their own exploration. Exploration, And if you find it satisfactory, wonderful. If you find their answers and their findings less than satisfactory, well, you should explore on your own and find out for yourself where you can correct them. So uh, in, in that sense, we named this course Exploring Hinduism, an overview. Okay, this is the first of the course, Exploring Hinduism, an overview. Uh, so with that, I will uh, uh, end my remarks and we can uh, continue to have some Q&A uh, for a few more minutes. I do not want to extend it for very long, maximum 15 minutes and then we're gonna end it, okay? So, uh, Nima, you can call on specific people. Uh, Ankur, Bidin Ankur and Nima, you can call on specific. You select the questions, allow them to ask the questions. Okay. And just before we get back into questions, please fill out the one minute survey in the chat window. It's been pasted and I'll continue to put that. It's less than a minute. Just fill it out. Let us know what you think. Give us feedback. We are in this to get better, improve, grow together. So, Nima Ji, if you want to handles taking people's questions. The chat, the Q&A box is packed. Still. Yes. Um, and uh, can, I, uh, can I just say, say something, Nima, if you don't mind? Sure, okay, sure. All the Q&A, obviously in 15 minutes that uh, Kalyanji says, we'll not be able to cover all the questions, but uh, we'll be, uh, whatever we can take, certainly do it now. Beyond that, some of the questions we'll be happy to answer post-event also tomorrow day after, which you can forward it to the to be concerned, people who ask the questions, whichever format that you have. Great. So um, I'm looking through uh, some of the Q&A. There's a lot of uh, uh, questions in the Q&A, but there are some themes that are sort of emerging. So um, I'll kind of pick on the theme, but I'll pick one specific question that's asked, but I'll ask you to sort of ask it in the context of a larger theme, which is developing across the, the Q&A. So, uh, Shri Padma Ganpati, uh, I'm not sure if we have the capability to have her ask her question directly. Is that, uh, is that possible? Uh, let's see here. Okay. Um, so I'll just, I'll just ask on her behalf, and, um, but you can answer in the context of a larger sort of theme, which is, again, this theme of uh, realism versus symbolism. So Sri Padma Ganpati asks, if Shiva is a concept, how did Arjuna uh, fight with Shiva in the Mahabharata? Right? And this is a question coming from her son, actually. Um, okay. There are a lot of questions in this vein. If you look at sort of drama and Mahabharata. Well, the way also, Vishnu, yeah. the way Vishnu, you call it avatara. The word avatara means to descend. Okay, that's what it means. So avatara. Shiva has a similar concept. It's called Avir Bhava. In Avatara, you have to be born in a womb and then live a full life and then and, and go through all the travails of life. So that's what Vishnu took that form of Avatara. And most of the thing, it's all Avatara. Whereas uh, Shiva decided to take a shortcut. It's called Avir Bhava. So he can appear for some time somewhere and then he can again leap. So, so that is how it is. So Shiva takes on different forms of Avir Bhava at different times through times. Some of them have been recorded in Shiva Purana and various other texts. So that's how it, it comes through to us. Which you have explained in our book, Understanding Shiva. How, as to how the concept of Avid Bhava and how he can, can come and go. So, so that is how you can explain this concept of Shiva suddenly coming in a few places. Because you have this both in uh, the North uh, in different parts of India and actually in deep south in say Madurai also you have a famous Minachi temple. It's one of the beautiful temples of uh, South India, one of the most beautiful temples where you have Shiva coming in person. So you have this in different places. 
So across the land, you, you have these different stories of Avir Baba, all so beautifully with gels and meshes with the different Puranic legends of the land, local folklore of the land, across the land. He's coming as a fisherwoman, he's coming as a woodcutter, he's coming as a warrior, not only to Arjuna. Arjuna is just for example, we know of, of say Mahabharata. He's coming in different, different forms in, in, in different, different places. So that is the depth, the beauty, the diversity as the, what you call the concept, the Tattva force can also manifest for short periods of time. Great. So um, Vishnu and Ramesh uh, Pona, Ponapali ask, what is a good book you would suggest for uh, young teenage kids to understand Hinduism in simple terms? Think around the age of 13, 14, maybe a little bit older. Start with creation and because uh, that is, see, if we can fathom that book, it's we have tried to bring as simple as possible. Ask the most profound question and answer it as simple as possible. I think that will lead to everything else from there on. And uh, we have had young children read that book and ask us sublime questions. All in their mid teens have, have read the book and asked us over the last 10 years repeatedly. So that's it's a very simple, small book. It's just 120 pages. It's not voluminous. And there are films, short films from creation as well. There are 20 short sure. films It's for viewing in our YouTube channel. Bharat Gyan YouTube channel. They can go see it there. And uh, it's simply astounding. For example, why should Brahma come from a lotus and not from a rose or a chrysanthemum or a jasmine? What is the road... What does the lotus signify? Why should that? So they asked these questions and answered that there. It's so simple, so beautiful. Great. So lots of questions on yoga. Will you be covering yoga in the course? It's a sort of role in, in sort of the modern world. Um, any, any thoughts on that subject? In the six, first batch of 16 courses, probably no. But in the next set of courses, yoga is included, which we already uh, shared with you. And we also have a mini book called Yoga the Union. It's about a 50 pager. It's available for free read in our website in the mini book section. Okay. And, and uh, okay, fundamentally, uh, see, even when we talk about yoga, we will be talking about what does yoga mean? And why is yoga there? Uh, the uh, underlying uh, philosophy behind yoga, the underlying science behind yoga, more than the actual asanas and what benefits you would gain and so on and so forth. So uh, let, let so me make one quick point. Start... Well, Hariji, one point here. Okay. See, I, I think uh, for the audience, uh, you know, we have a whole sequence of courses in yoga at Hindu University of America taught by other faculty as well. So therefore, uh, you know, uh, you know, one course cannot cover the whole, the whole world of Hinduism, you know. So therefore, uh, we've, we've done a little bit of a design, uh, Hariji and Hemaji have uh, come up with a particular structure for this course. I think you'll find it very exciting, and very informative. And if you like it, then you can certainly continue and take other courses in the in the future uh, and expand and continue your exploration of Hinduism. So that's all the that's the whole point of this. You know, you're uh, we, we're uh, suggesting that here is an entry point into the world of exploring Hinduism. You know, so uh, if everything is not covered in the very first course or in this one hour's webinar. It is uh, completely uh, understandable. So therefore, uh, we request your patience on this. Uh, and I think there is a lot to explore and uh, and learn. All right, back to, back to you. Just to piggyback on that, a lot of people are asking, what is this first course in context of the series of courses? Gayanji just answered that beautifully, right? This is an entry point. Because that question was coming up, what is the context of this one course in the bigger picture? And uh, if... You want to continue on that? That is just been answered. Uh, uh, Ankur, I would just like to add to this. 
see the chart that I showed about uh, the various aspects that we would be uh, touching upon in the intro course. Fundamentally, these are the handles that we grabbed for us to also learn about Hinduism holistically, uh, not just as only from the divinity or symbolism perspective, but holistically as to what the thought and the lifestyle is. So these are handles. So once you do get, you know, do this intro course and get a, and you have your uh, vision open to these kind of handles, then you know how to follow it up on your own, or you could then continue further as we take each of these handles and then explore further. Great. Um, Kalyanji, I think we're at the 15 minute mark here. So in the interest of time, I'd like to uh, hand it back to you, uh, Hemaji, Hariji, if you have any final uh, thoughts, um, anything yeah. you want to say. Let, let, me, let me take a couple of minutes. Uh, you know, so uh, I just want to uh, address uh, a couple of questions, just broadly, okay. So there's a question about, is Hinduism monotheistic or it is, is it polytheistic, okay? It's a very interesting question. And I'll just take a minute and answer this, okay? See, Hinduism has allowed space for both monotheism and polytheism and panentheism and all kinds of theisms that you can think of. So in a sense, Hinduism is fundamentally accommodative of a variety of perspectives and views. And what that does is it creates a, a fundamental inherent capacity to respect and honor different ways of relating to the divine. Okay. This cannot be said of other, other religions which, uh, you know, claim that they know the truth. And by virtue of them knowing the truth, everybody else has got nothing but falsehood. And therefore you know what happens afterwards, right? They're free to convert the entire world on their account. That's just one answer, okay? How does it conceive the divine in so many plural ways, so many different, diverse, pluralistic ways? How is it possible? Well, I think you should take the course. The course will get into it in a much deeper level. So that's one answer, okay? Now, the second answer, the, the, the second question I want to take is there's just a lot of... Uh, lot of talk in the chat window on the caste system. And I, I understand uh, many of you have very strong views. And uh, you, I mean, you know, Hindus have internalized the pain of the caste system or the criticism about the caste system that they have experienced for the last 200 years. And the West found, the British found the caste system to be a uniquely vulnerable point on which to relentlessly criticize India. That's number one. Number two, all of you should know that over a 200 year period, England extracted some $45 trillion of wealth from India, $45 trillion of wealth over a 200 year period. During that time, India was terribly impoverished and many of the problems, evils uh, that we find today in Hindu, in the society that Hinduism gets criticized about really emerged in the wake of British colonization of India. And we had to remember also that British colonization came in the aftermath of relentless Islamic conquest of India. So to internalize the view that the problems of Hindu society are entirely because of the ancient Vedic uh, tradition and culture is to bypass the, the horrors of being in, invaded, colonized, and brutalized for a very long period of time. And that particular experience is somehow avoided in schools and colleges and in curricula around the world. So I, I just want to uh, offer that as a cautionary note before we you know, make a claim that we all should apologize and endlessly apologize for the caste system, etc. cetera. Uh, we need to learn a lot more about the nature of the, of the system, the Varnajati system, how it was in times of prosperity and how it became in, in, it came to be in times of poverty and what were the intervening events that caused this decline of the system. 
So, you know, one thing is very clear. We There's a lot for us to learn and a lot for us to explore and understand. Uh, and, 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 you know, if we, and, and our barrier, the greatest barrier to understand, to understanding, the greatest barrier to learning is the notion that we already know. You know, if you already know everything, what is there to learn? There's nothing there to learn anymore. Okay. So we are, we are offering an invitation for those of you who are willing to learn, interested in learning, even if you have uh, doubts, even if you are skeptical, even if you wonder about various things, bring your skepticism, bring your questions, bring your doubts into the course and have the course unfold, uh, you know, possible answers for you. Uh, and that is going to be my last word on this, on today's webinar. Uh, all of you are welcome. Of course, the teenagers are more, more than welcome. We want to entertain as many teenagers as possible uh, in this course. And I'm sure you're going to find it very, very uh, engaging and interesting. With that, let me say goodbye. Thank you. Namaste, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we will be sending follow-up, you know, register. Uh, if you registered, we have the survey link. We'll send the webinar replay out to everyone who wants it. If you just click the links and fill in the information. Um, any closing thoughts, Dr. Hurry, Dr. Hurry, and uh, Namaya, and then we'll just end this webinar. Uh, thank you all for organizing such a beautiful seminar or webinar uh, so that, uh, you know, we could share so that to help us share what we gathered during our journey with the teens of America. And uh, hopefully we'll find many more such, uh, you know, people emerging who will come up with their own uh, understanding and will be able to take on the stage and explain this to future generations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you all for joining. Thank you all. Let's close the webinar. Bye-bye. Uncle, can I ask a quick question before we leave? Uh, let's take it offline. Okay. I'll send you an email. Oh. Thank you. Namaste all. Uncle Ji, should I end the meeting? Yes, please. Yeah, please. Okay. Dhaniwadev.